we are excited to have you here as our honourable guest. And be assured, you have our full attention. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, Rahul Gandhi, I mean, honestly. Thank you. You, you, have a little bit, you have a little bit of an Indian accent. Ah. Hindi <laughs> bolte? No, not Hindi, Bangla. Bangla. That makes sense. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, yes, anyway, so I've been trying to impress people over the last few days that, ah, Rahul Gandhi, okay, so he's, he's famous in his own right, etc., etc., but he is actually, well, it's perfectly within the realm of possibilities, the next Prime Minister of India. <laughs> so I was I was instructed to to sort of have a few yeah. questions for you and a little conversation. And then uh, my colleague here, who organized everything, Katinka Freista, organized you. everything, uh, is also sending me questions from the audience. At some point, it will be closed down, but um, so select the <laughs> questions. So, great, let's just stop. You ready? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. I had um, uh, some questions written down. So, okay, but the first thing first, the reason why you're so interesting, it's not just because you're in this next. <coughs> Prime Minister, quite possibly, um, but also because of your your history as a politician. I mean, you you in many ways it's it's been interesting to follow you because in in some ways you're different from other politicians. You're slightly reluctant politician, if that's possible to say. You know, you know you've been in and out and and sort of pulled out and then you're back in. Uh, and and you've done and 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 for a while we thought, oh, well, he's a goner. Uh, but then you sort of jump back and. And here you are, and you just finished the, the, this long march and energized a lot of activists. And it was quite a marvelous spectacle. And so, so my question is, as, as the leader, you're not formerly the leader of, of Congress, but you're the most famous face of the Congress, big star attraction. So what, so how do you see your role in all of this? Your microphone, isn't Oh, microphone. How do you see your role in all of this? Um, and your and your sort of contribution <coughs> to re-energizing, to making Congress and this broad alliance into really that fighting force that you need to have in order to counter BJP and its its you know enormous uh, media strategy, its war chest <coughs> and its enormous position all over the country. How do you see yourself in that role, sort of creating, recreating, energizing? Congress and the alliance. Yeah. So, I mean, the first, the first thing one has to realize when you're uh, thinking about India is that until 2014, democracy in India was about a set of political parties fighting each other. Uh, neutral institutions, free and fair elections, uh, access to media for everybody, access for finance to everybody. In 2014, this changed completely. So, in India today, we no longer fight a political party. So the entire game has changed. Um, institutions are captured by the RSS. The agencies, CBI, ED, Income Tax Department, have been weaponized. They attack those who resist the ideology of the BJP. 
So, we are no longer fighting your regular political contest. We are actually now fighting the architecture of the Indian state. Mm. Which means that the techniques we used earlier, interviews, conversations like this, they're not available to us anymore. Uh, it might surprise some of you. You might have noticed that you've seen me talking to students in the United States, you've seen me talking to students in France, you are seeing me here talking to you. I can't do this in India. I'm physically not allowed to enter Indian universities, as are most of our opposition leaders. If we try to go into uh, a university in India, we find that the vice chancellor belongs to the RSS, and he makes it very clear to us that discussion is not acceptable inside Indian universities. So that is the real paradigm shift. You know, you said India's the largest democracy. It's true. But for me, a, democ a democracy where you're not allowed to express your voice, where you're not allowed to say what you feel, where large numbers of people are not given that opportunity, is a weakening democracy. And that's what we have in India. Large parts of our population are not allowed to speak. They are threatened. Political leadership is crushed. I've got 24 cases on me. Mm. I've been interrogated for 55 hours. I've been given a jail sentence, two-year jail sentence. The first time in India, somebody's been given a maximum sentence for criminal defamation, a jail sentence for um, criminal defamation. I'm the first person who's ever had that done to them, right? So, so this is what we're facing. A lot of what you hear about me, uh, the idea that I'm reluctant, comes through the lens of the BJP. And that lens distorts reality and truth. Um, what we found is that the old tools don't work. Mm. And a lot of people ask me, during my walk, before my walk, after my walk, why have you walked these 4,000 kilometers? The reason we walked the 4,000 kilometers is because we had no option. It was the only way left for us to get our message across to the people of India. What we didn't imagine was that it was an extremely powerful way to do it. And it taught us a tremendous amount about our country, about how to speak to our country, about how to listen to our country. But if you ask me in 2005, even 2012, that I would be walking across from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, 4,000 kilometers, I would say, no way. But it became a political necessity for us. And we've realized that when democracy is under attack and voice is being attacked, then the only real way to combat that is through action, through walking, through physically going and meeting people. And that's really the only instrument that the opposition in India has left for it. Okay, so two, two for all questions. Long, long answer, but yeah, yeah, I needed yeah, to set the foundation. Excellent, excellent. But follow up question, what is your personal contribution to this? And why did you decide uh, that you would be a good leader? You would be sort of the uh, uh, person to, to lead in this? No, I don't... I don't. everybody could do it. I mean, just give them a... Ev idea. Everybody can do it. Everybody should do it. And I don't decide these things. Uh, I defend a particular ideology in my country. I, I deeply understand I deeply understand uh, a particular ideology. I have spent a lot of time fighting for it. It's the ideology of Mahatma Gandhi, it's the ideology of Buddha, it's the ideology of Guru Nanak, uh, it's the ide ideology of voice, and I fight for it. Uh, whether I become the leader, don't become the leader, these are secondary questions. In today's India, I feel that we are in an ideological struggle. And we are in an ideological struggle for the future of our country. Mm. And I think it's the responsibility of all of us to defend our position. 
and that's what I do. I enjoy that. It's difficult. I get hurt every now and then, but I brush myself, get up, and go back to work. Because you could have been a businessman, or you could have been something quiet, right? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, no, I don't, uh, academic. That's very nice. It's very one of my one of my best friends. Uh, uh, when I when I was sort of getting my jail sentence, he called me up and he says, you know, I've known you now 20 years. Uh, you're always trying to get yourself into trouble. Right, <laughs> right, right, okay. okay. So, so that's, that's a habit. I, I don't like unfairness. I don't like um, it when people bully other people, when people frighten other people, and I tend to like to stand up for them. Okay, very good. It's just my nature. It irritates me when I see power being misused. It's not, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not a mental thing. It's not a mental thing. It's like a, uh, it's a hard thing. Hmm. It just disturbs me. It doesn't matter who they are. Um, if they're being pushed around, if they're feeling, uh, you know, pressured because of power, uh, somebody is being, even if an animal is being mistreated, uh, it disturbs me deeply. I miss your beard. You had such a wonderful beard after the after the the walk. Uh, it looks so impressive. People have different views on that. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people miss it. Some people don't like it. Other people want it short. Right. Some people want it shaved in a you know in a particular yeah. way. But that's part of the territory. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, so it, it does vary though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I noticed. It's I noticed. A bit longer yeah. now. It yeah. Looks, so. yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks good. Looks good. I say right. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, so, but, but, but returning to the question of, of, of your political part of the Congress, I mean, I've, I spent quite some time in West Bengal, and, and Congress hasn't been in power for since 1977 in West Bengal, but it's still there. It's like everywhere, right? So in every village, you have Congress wallas, uh, in every neighborhood in the city. They're everywhere. And, and even during election campaigns, non-election, you'll find these flags, and and the uh, chakra and uh, so so the Congress is a bit everywhere, but it's also a bit sort of it's a bit the establishment. It's not really, but not the political establishment. It's, it's you know, the, the old people. They're well established. They're sort of doing their own stuff. So 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 question is, you know, that appeal to the young voters. How are you going to contribute that appeal to the young voters and to really re-energize Congress into that sort of that fighting force so, that you need? So there's there's two ways to look at the Congress. Mm. There's what you're de describing, uh, the Congress organization. That's a political organization, and that's weak in Bengal. And it's strong in Karnataka. Yeah. Uh, it's strong in Maharashtra. It's strong in some parts and it's weak in other parts. The other way to describe the Congress is as, as an idea. Right? And as one of the central visions for India's people. Mm. Right? And that is not weak at all. That is very strong. Now sometimes there's a mismatch between the idea and the ability of the organization to pick up the heart of the idea. Right? And you can see that the Congress Party goes through that transition. Um, that's what we are in the process of doing today. We are redefining the Congress organization and bringing it closer to the Congress idea. The Congress idea is a revolutionary idea. Uh, to give you a sense, we fought the British, we fought them non-violently, and we defeated them. Uh, we didn't kill them, we didn't threaten them. Affectionately, we defeated a superpower. That's the Congress idea. And that's very strong in the Indian heart and in the Indian mind. That idea is under attack right now by the RSS idea. Violent, mm. uh, male chauvinistic idea. So, so how do we strengthen the Congress? By making it defend the Congress idea all across the country. By making sure that wherever the Congress idea is being attacked, the Congress organization is doing 
the defense of that idea. And when we do that, we naturally find the Congress organization grows. Uh, opening the doors of the Congress, Congress has been in power uh, for a long time. It has a traditional hierarchy, and it's very important that those doors open and younger people come in. We've been very successful in some states. We've been not so successful in other states. Um, but that's how one builds the Congress organization. Right. There, are, there are millions and millions of people who believe strongly in the Congress idea, not necessarily in the Congress organization. And that's the gap that we have to bridge. We have to open the doors of the Congress organization to bring all those people in. Hmm. Which, of course, also, uh, you know, uh, or a, secondary, a second strategy is, of course, you know, your, your big alliance. Uh, where it was called? I have India. In Indian National Developmental Inclusive Alliance. India. It's not a, it's not a name that comes easily to, uh, but... Uh, but there's an acronym. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, so it's a good acronym. It's a very good acronym. Yes, yes. I mean, it, see, it's supposed to be complicated, so you use the acronym. Right, 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 right. Good point, good point. We're quite yes, clever. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, but of course, then the, the prime minister went ahead and changed the name of the country. Yeah. That, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you can see, you can see. I, I don't think I don't think there's been any other political formation, <laughs> such an who by choosing their name has made the incumbent change the name of the country. <laughs> I, I think I think that's a world record. And and the funny thing is. Uh, the next part of this story, because if and when he does change the name, we will also change the name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he will have to change the name again. <laughs> right? So there's no, there's no reason we can't fit those ideas into the acronym Bharat. <laughs> right. so, but it, it tells you a little bit about the panic in the mind of the BJP and the RSS, you said, you know, they're so strong and they're so powerful and they're so big. I deal with them. I fight with them. They're actually not that powerful. They're not actually that strong. Um, they have a lot of resources. They have capture of the Indian state. Uh, but the, the moment the large mass of Indian people start to um, stitch together, mm you will not find uh, the BJP and the RSS uh, will be able to contest that. So, so, so let's move on to this, this question of the... I mean, the, there is the, the uh, alliance, um, and it's very many partners. I can't remember exactly the, the figure, the number of political parties in it. Some of them are quite large and, and it's, uh, constitutional. It's also growing. It's also growing, right, right. But you run into all sorts of problems, don't you? Because it's, it's, a lot of these partners are also rivals, such as West Bengal. You have what? You have Congress, you have Trinamul, you have uh, CPIM, you have CPI. They're all sort of fighting one another. Um, and then you're asking them to, to sort of, or the activists, to change their minds and, and start collaborating with... With, with people they previously fought against. So, so this must be a bit of a challenge, isn't it, to, to keep this alliance going and to make you, it into an alternative? If you ask the Indian students here, mm. they'll tell you mm. that Indian people know how to deal with complexity. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> you, know, you, you, guys, you guys have first course, second course, mm. dessert. Yes. We yes. have a thali with 20 <laughs> different things on it. And then we don't, we don't stop there. <laughs> then, what do we do? We take all those yeah, <laughs> katoris <laughs> and we make one big mess in the middle. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we eat, right? Right. So yeah. we understand complexity. Right. And, and the thing to do when you're dealing with large complexity is to make one or two simple rules that can manage that complexity. Mm -hmm. So what are the rules? The first rule is that every single person on that alliance, regardless of which party, is agreed that we are not going to tolerate the murder of Indian democracy. Mm. We're not going to accept it. Mm. Second, every single person over there is of the view 
okay, is of the view that we are not going to let the RSS capture our institutional framework. So that's the first, that's the first point of agreement. Second point of agreement is everybody there agrees that the level of inequality that is being generated in India is not acceptable. Mm. That two or three business houses control the entire infrastructure. The agencies are used to help them knock out other business people. That 200 plus million people have gone into poverty over the last nine years. This is not acceptable to any of our partners. That we face continuous price rise, not acceptable. So those are the two broad frameworks. The third I could add would be all of them agree that government needs to spend much more money on healthcare and education and needs to be involved in that. <laughs> that that's the agreement. Now, where is the disagreement? The disagreement is in a number of states, right? Where, as you said, we are competitors. So there are some states where that is a simple equation. State like Kerala, we fight the left. We ensure that BJP doesn't win a single seat there. And we have a full-scale fight with the left. We don't agree with them ideolo ideologically. Let's see who wins. But whoever wins, the BJP is not there. Mm. So that's pretty simple, right? There are other states where it's slightly more complicated. Uh, Bengal is slightly more complicated. Uh, UP is slightly more complicated. And there it's a negotiation. Uh, it's pretty clear in Bengal um, that it would be beneficial for everybody to stand together against the BJP. Can we achieve that? Probably. What would it look like? Mm. I can't tell you right now. So you see how in India we take the massive amount of complexity, like the, all those katoris, we put them together, and then we can eat. <laughs> so, so we've been instructed to move on to the Q&A uh, part of this, because there isn't uh, a whole lot of time. But I have one last question for you. Uh, First, and that is now, um, you know, we, we imagine that there is a, a change of government next year. You're in power, you're likely Prime Minister Karanet, although that's not entirely, you know. Um, so, so, but there is a change of government. India Alliance wins, and there's a new government. So, what, so the question is, what will you do? So, so one year down the line, two years down the line, five years down the line, what will be your priorities? What is it that BJP has done that you will keep? What will you try to reform? What are sort of your list of priorities here? And what is your vision for India? Uh, okay, on the, on, the, on the leadership front, I, I forgot to mention, uh, what we've agreed in the alliance is that we are not going to talk about leadership. Yeah until we won the election. Right. After we won the election, we can have that discussion. But having that discussion before we win the election only helps the BJP and creates confusion. So that's, that's something that yeah. is also being taken, uh, you know, uh, cleared. What will we do? What will the alliance do when we come to power? Uh, number one, we will reclaim the democratic tradition in India. And we will go back to institutions that are neutral. We will go back to institutions that do not belong to a particular party or a particular ideology, but we'll go back to institutions that belong to the people of India. How do you do that? We do that by making sure that they are not pressurized, that, not, that people who run these institutions are not threatened, that they're not um, mm. attacked, and that they're allowed to do their job. Right? Uh, the institutions, in, the institutions belong to the people of India. And institutions are there to be neutral. They're not, they don't belong to a political party. So the moment we stop trying to shape the behavior of the institutions, like the RSS and BJP do, they'll go back to work. Right? So that's, that's one piece of it. Mm. 
The second part, which is a challenge in some ways for uh, Europe and the United States, as well as India, is the fact that if we look at the planet today, um, we look at this, this microphone, we look at my phone, we look at this computer, we see that they are mostly made in China. And clearly, without any doubt, the Chinese have proven to the entire planet mm. that they can produce successfully, they can manufacture better than anybody else, but they do, they do so in a coercive, non-democratic environment. Yeah. This they have proven to everybody. They have essentially dismantled the production networks of the United States, the production yes, networks of uh, Europe, and also, to a great extent, the production networks of India by successfully doing this. Mm. For us, to not manufacture, to not produce a country of 1.4 billion people is not an option. Mm. We will have such massive levels of unemployment and anger that as, as a nation we will not be sustainable. So China has placed a vision on the table. It is called the Belt and Road. The heart of that vision is production, dominance of global production. We are asking the question, can we place an alternative vision on the table? Right. A vision where India, the United States, Europe work together to produce, not in a coercive environment, not in an environment where you do not give political freedom to your people, but in an environment where you give political freedom, economic freedom, social freedom to your people. So this, to me, is the central challenge facing not just India, Europe, the United States. I think it will impact all the students in this room. If we are unsuccessful, I think the students in this room will find that their future will not be as bright as it should be. So that, that would be the centerpiece of the type of work that we would want to do. Now that has a number of components. Yeah. It requires infrastructure. It requires a different type of education system. It, it requires protection for our people. So that would be the central piece and then you would have structures that would support that. The final thing that I personally think is very important is that there are very, very large groups, large parts of India that are not included in the growth and the success of India. When you look at India from outside as a Western person, you see tremendous success, tremendous growth. But when you look at it from inside India, you see that people from lower caste communities, people from tribal communities, people from minority communities, uh, people from Dalit communities are not part of that. They're simply excluded from that growth. And that is something that India will never ever be successful without solving. So much greater inclusion. Inclusion not only in terms of economic growth, in terms of wealth, but in terms of social respect, mm. in terms of protection. So that would be overall how we would think about it. What would we keep uh, that the BJP has done? What would we not differ with them on? Uh, probably some of the work that they've done in infrastructure. Uh, I think that, that would be the, uh, the mainstay of it. We do not agree with what they've done to the education system. They have uh, tried to erase history, so I, I cannot say that we agree with them on that. Uh, some of the work they've done in healthcare, probably we would agree with. The broad direction um, of our economy, the broad direction of our relationship with the United States, relationship with Europe, probably agree with, similar. Mm. Yeah. Including war in Ukraine uh, stance. We would agree with their Stance on the war in Ukraine, yes. Yeah? Yes. You don't want to come over to our side on...
It's not, see, the thing is, it's not, it's not come over to your side or come over to their side. Mm. We are completely against the violence and the pain that is being felt by the Ukrainian people and by the Russians who are dying in Ukraine. And we think it should stop as fast as possible. Okay? And, and we understand that in the 21st century, having a war in the middle of Europe is not a good idea, is dangerous for Europe, is dangerous for us, is dangerous for everybody. But as a large country, we have relationships with multiple people. Mm. We, can't, we cannot ignore the fact that we have a relationship with the United States, we have a relationship with Europe, we have a relationship with Russia, we have a relationship with Iran. These are things that large countries, by their very nature, have to have. Right? And uh, you can shape them, but you are also limited by them. Good, good, good. Okay, so, sorry, uh, moving on to questions and answers. Um, there are three questions that have been sent by my colleague. You've answered some of them uh, already, I think. Um, so, but I'll, I'll just sort of quickly recap them for you, um, so you can sort of decide if you want to elaborate. One deals with um, public health that's been largely sidelined um, by, by Indian, in Indian politics for a very long time, um, and, and it's underfunded. Second question is um, strategies... Uh, uh, sorry, you've answered that, basically. So, okay. Should I just take the first question quickly? Okay, okay, yes, quickly. So, uh, when you look at India, um, one frame is you look at the whole of India, and the other frame is you look at different states in the union. So some of the most cutting-edge work in healthcare is being done in Rajasthan. Uh, and those are some of the principles that we're going to use. Uh, for us, Rajasthan is a pilot. Right. And if we do come to power, we will use some of those principles and spread them across the country. It's true that both healthcare and education have not received the type of funding they should get. And we are pretty firm on the idea that the government needs to be aggressively involved in education and in healthcare and should spend much more money uh, in both these areas. Very good. Excellent. So last two questions. Um, so one is also from the audience. Um, I'll read it because it was sort of um, it was a very um, interesting one. Um, NRIs are enjoying religious freedom abroad, but they don't want religious freedom in India. What will you tell them? What will we tell them? That... No, no, that... that, that <laughs> no. Uh, not allowing religious freedom in India fundamentally weakens India. Mm. And if you think... And if you think that India should be weakened, we don't agree with you. So for us, it is very important that all people from India are allowed to follow their religion, are allowed to express themselves. Minorities, lower castes, Dalits, tribals, everybody is a part of India. And everybody should be allowed to thrive, to have an imagination. And if you subvert anybody, if you crush anybody's imagination, you're damaging the country. Mm. And we don't appreciate people who damage the country. Last question. Um, or two questions, actually. Two questions. We, okay. Or, no, we don't have all that much time. So I just spent a few days in... But the thing is, you don't have the liberty to do this with the Prime Minister of India. <laughs> You can't, you can't, you can't say two, three, four. You can't even say one. No, no. I don't. <laughs> okay, but I'll, ha I'll have a, I have an interesting question for you, possibly, because I just spent a few days in Sweden and and part of a, a, a sort of a TV deba debate there. The question was ri raised: Is India still a democracy? And there were three in the panel. Two said yes. One said no. So it's like I don't know. What is your take on that? Is India still a democracy, or is it 
turning into something else? That's one question, and you can mull on that while I ask my second question, which is very short. Why Norway? This is why, why, why are you spending time with us? This is a tiny little country. Uh, it's, the, it's smaller than Burdwan District. So I was, you know, there is Uttar Pradesh mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. um, hundreds of millions of people. And then there are states like Meghalaya in India. Not many people. Mm. But both the voices are equally important to us. So, so, so the nature, the nature of the nature of it is that it doesn't matter how many people live in Norway uh, and that you are a small population. You might have some very innovative ideas. Mm. You might have some very interesting things coming out of the small population. So why should we forego that? And second, I think, at least from my perspective, there's a lot we can learn from you. I, I really appreciate the way you manage your resources. I would like to understand better how you've done such a tremendous job, how you've built your, your sovereign fund. Right? You've done some excellent work in mobility. I'd like to get a sense of what that is. And I'd also like to get, help you understand some of the difficulties that we're facing, some of the interesting things that we are thinking about. So, uh, conversation is always a good thing. And you have good food here. Ah, uh, well, a lot of some. Is India still a democracy? Is India still a democracy? India's democracy is under severe ass assault and attack. Uh, India is also defending its democracy. Mm. It's a difficult job, but it's doing so. Uh, when that defense stops, if it stops, then I will say India is not a democracy anymore. But there are still many, many people who are contesting the attack on the democratic structure. Right. So I cannot say uh, the fight is over. I think we're going to win the fight. I, I view this as a transition. Um, both India and China have or are trying to manage the largest migration of people from rural areas to urban mm. areas in history. It's the biggest migration ever. Now, so to think that this is going to happen without any turbulence, without any pressure, that's naive, right? So a lot of these pressures turbulences, structural problems are coming because of this massive transition that we are, we are going through. Uh, and it's expected. What will come out at the end of it? Will we be able to give India a democratic, plural vision? Will we be able to hold the structure together? Will we be able to thrive? That's really the question. We are very clear that India's diversity, the different languages, the different states, different cultures, will simply not absorb what the RSS is trying to place mm. on top of it. We, we do not think that India can survive a centralization of power the way the BJP uh, is doing. And that's why we're defending it. And we also understand that India has an important role because of its size, because of its scale internationally. And it has certain responsibilities. Uh, Indian democracy, in my view, is a global public good. It just is, doesn't just belong to India. It is something that will affect the entire planet. Imagine uh, if three Europe suddenly went autocratic. That's the scale of India. So it's important that we defend it. It's our responsibility. We're doing it. But it's important that the rest of the world knows what's going on back home. We're running out of time. Actually, we're, we're past whatever our time limit was set. So anyway, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Rahul Gandhi, ladies and gentlemen. Rahul Gandhi.
I like. Thank you. Thank you. Can I can I say two words? Uh -huh. I I must say. I've noticed I've noticed two things that I have to say here. Uh, one is I love the format you've used. I've I've never used this format before, and I think it's a wonderful format, standing mm. and chatting like this. And the second thing I've noticed, which uh, says a lot about uh, Norway, is that I've not met a Norwegian woman who doesn't shake hands firmly, uh. which tells me, <laughs> which tells me, which tells me that uh, they're doing very well, yes. and uh, they're playing a very important role in society, and they're emancipated. So that's a very nice uh, feeling. Thank you. Thank you.